great honor for me to be in this August gathering and uh, I'd like to offer this humble presentation by starting with a quote from Derrida, the famous postmodern philosopher, we are all mediators, translators. Many contemporary scholars from the Protestant, Anglican, and Catholic tradition have endeavored to mediate new constructs on marriage. But the traditional Christian theology of marriage has been shattered by the experience of abuse and misery. Dr. Frank just explained in detail. Therefore, these scholars have endeavored to review, translate, and interpret the contemporary social condition through innovative hermeneutical readings of Holy Scripture and tradition. Have their reconstructive methodologies generated new theologies of marriage that made marital life better? Is the human being, the anthropos, today more advanced, not just in terms of technology, but also in social relationships that carry more happiness and more meaning. So I attempt to present these new translations from various Christian perspectives and also an Orthodox Church's perspective as well. Some preliminary elements used are as follows in postmodernity, in postmodern epistemological development. First, relativity. That is, each era has different episteme, whereby developments unfold new meanings. Second, radical diversity, subjectivity, coexistence, and freedom. That is, being open to new ideas and new possibilities in life. A necessity to correlate various human experiences from different people, from different areas, and bring into public discourse more voices from diverse groups. Third, the use of inductive reasoning, that is working with the contextual facts and figures of the contemporary society to interpret everything as being socially constructed. They use the triadic tactics, these scholars, the triadic tactics, which I name them as accommodating thinking, the golden thread, and critical feminism. Accommodating thinking is where scholars bend what is considered as absolute, objective theory to fit the subjective, personally desired fact. For example, many search for biblical verses or stories of saints to accommodate their subjective views on homosexuality. And we know that many claim that uh, Saints Sergios and Bacchus had a, some kind of a relationship, and they considered this part of the tradition. And so they, they were linked by the love of Christ. The golden thread selects out a verse of the Holy Scripture or a motif of Holy Tradition and makes this verse as the key to understand everything else regardless of the original context motif of the verse. We have the famous critic, uh, famous feminist critic Daphne Hapson, who explains that how feminist scholars use the verse neither male nor female, St. Paul, to build on, to build on it the feminist theology. And the third tactic is critical feminism. It calls to reconstruct both Judaism and Christian traditions and to find fruitful analogies, not necessarily identities, between them, as well as contemporary moral philosophy for the purpose of rough cultural consensus. So these three tactics used together led to what we call aporia in scripture contradictions, in scriptures and tradition, leading to the dissolution of the Christian ethical principles, such as the principle of marriage between a male and a female, the result is the death of marriage. 
In the following, I will present samples from prominent authors of the Protestant, Anglican, and Roman Catholic traditions. In the moral theology of the Western Christian mind, Protestant Reformation scholars use a dual language on marriage, a sociologically, culturally related language, and a biblical, ecclesiastically related language. The Protestant perspective can be seen, for example, in the writings of Professor Don Browning in his book, Marriage and Modernization. Browning's primary thesis is that modernization and globalization, economic development, and education are the impetus for social change, especially for the recontextualization of the institutions of marriage and family. Browning uses critical feminism, seeing that the reconstruction work of marriage and gender roles ought to be realized through a multi-dimensional task involving economic, political, legal, psychological, and religio-cultural perspectives, and must be done in a worldwide scope. This reconstruction process is informed by the Western Christian tradition and includes a dialogue with other religions. The Anglican perspective, I chose to present it by Professor Adrian Thatcher from England. Thatcher endeavors to develop a systematic Christian theology of marriage. Using ample exegetical notes and historical ar argumentation, his basic views recognize the cultural relativity of traditional teaching on marriage and family he claims that much of these teachings worked injustice traditionally, especially for wives, abuse, and children. Thus, he calls the church and civic leaders to rework some of these pre modern marital norms to address postmodern concerns. However, in doing so, he utilizes accommodating thinking. Thatcher attempts to appropriate the Bible and tradition. He quotes a lot from the fathers but he appropriates them to the current cultural context of late modernity. In his book entitled Marriage After Modernity, Marriage in Postmodern Times, Thatcher states that since marriage is a historical and social institution, it is enmeshed in the changes signified by the transition from modernity to postmodernity. Thatcher sees the sacrament of marriage as based on two elements, just two main elements. The couple's male or female intense love and the raising of children. Those are the basic elements of the sacrament of marriage, according to him, and according to many uh, people he quotes from the church's tradition. He draws from various liturgical texts the claim that the right of betrothal is a religious way to solve the issue of premarital cohabitation and intimacy, physical intimacy, especially among youth. Generally, the Roman Catholic theological methodology interprets scripture from a perspective of dogmatic principles and papal pronouncements. Both contain a naturalistic, personalistic, and doctrinal languages and legalistic approaches. The Roman Catholic postmodern perspective is here represented I choose Professor Michael Lawler, also a famous scholar. Lawler tries to reconstruct certain issues related to the Roman Catholic understanding of marriage, sexuality, and divorce. He begins by presenting an archaeology of marriage and the Catholic teaching. He parallels the development of Catholic marital theology with the social transfer from pre-modern to postmodern times. Marriage, he notices, has moved from being a physical act focused, procreative, procreative institution whose only aim, and he quotes Pope Pius uh, VI, whose only aim the procreation and education of children to a model of interpersonal union based on love, agape, the love that wills and does the good of the other, an interpersonal communion of life. He quotes here, communion of life. St. Paul uh, the Sixth, the Pope uh, Paul the Sixth. So Lawler 
pushed for a culturally conditioned theology and to achieve a breakthrough in the Thomist tradition. He takes Pope John Paul II's uh, words as basis for his attempt to reconsider marriage as follows. A faith which does not become culture is a faith not fully received, not thoroughly thought through, not faithfully lived out. Again, this is a quote by Pope John Paul II. Concerning the recently published document Amoris Laetitia of Pope Francis, Lauder argued that the act of consummation must be understood as not just with its physicalist and legalistic context, but also with its psychological context. He thought that Catholics who go through a civil divorce undergo feelings of guilt and anguish due to their exclusion from the sacraments. Arguing from the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> Lawler attempts to reconstruct the possibility of divorce in the Catholic Church. Thus, he shows that divorce and remarriage can be justified historically, canonically, and theologically. Today, some claim that we reach the era of true love, egalitarianism, gender-free society, and the climax of individual happiness. Yet the factual state indicates that these scholarly claims, using the great faculty of rationalism to justify the shame of the fall, using the faculty of rationalism to justify the shame of the fall, did not help much. The human being today suffers more from inner déchirement, the dysfunction of marriages and the collapse of families. Generation after generation, human beings are victims. They have been suffering from inner fragmentation. We have an, an unprecedented crisis in anthropology. In this late, and now I'm going to speak the, uh, an ortho, give an orthodox perspective. In this late, in this era of late modernity, the call is to return to original texts and to the first principles, to the loyi. For the Orthodox Church, the first principle is that Christian truth, the person of Jesus Christ, who cannot be divided or deconstructed, because he is the very logos of human existence. He is the usia, the parousia, the being, the presence, the eschaton. The Church Fathers have a long history of mediating Christ, presenting him to the world, translating his logos as food for contemporary man. The Church, as a living organism, is a place of the transformational encounter between God and man. The orthodox theology of marriage uses deductive reasoning since it speaks of marriage as a mystery, mysterium consistent with scriptures and tradition, having the creed of faith as a reference despite changing historical and cultural circumstances. Thus, it calls people to search for ways, it calls people to search for ways that accommodate their contemporary life to their absolute faith, to live out the mystery of marriage in today's world and challenges. It is forever an empirical, ascetic, and charismatic theology. The Orthodox Church's perspective of marriage is totally foreign to today's secular demands of individual happiness and legalistic concepts of justice, egalitarianism. As Elder Emilianos explains about marriage, the one, I'm quoting, the one becomes a presence, a living reality, in the heart of the other. My husband, my wife, is a part of my being, of my flesh of my soul, he or she compliments me. It is this complementarity that Chrysostom admires in great awe. And I quote, it is the innovative wisdom of God divided the one into two opposites from the beginning and desiring to show that even after the, the division, they are still one anthropos. The only fundamental human right, the only fundamental human right is the right of theosis open to all humanity. 
In this sense, marriage is seen as a spiritual journey of repentance, a journey to holiness. The Orthodox theologians return to the stories of saints in all generations because the saints are our role models. In all cultures, in all societies, in order to dialogue with postmodern people, marriage is a great mystery, as St. Paul describes. Marriage in the church does not mean blessing what is natural, but it is rather the release of this new united couple in the path of the kingdom. Marriage is clearly an image of something far greater. It is the mystery of love, again, St. John Chrysostom. Being ontologically united as one flesh in Christ's love, in sacrificial love, in chaotic love, husband and wife grow together a new, as a new creation. They have an eschatological dimension. They are eternal witnesses of the union of Christ and the church. In this sense, the created reality of marriage is transfigured into the reality of the kingdom. Their unity in Christ means living the dialectic of his death and resurrection in their daily life through ascesis, through spiritual struggle, through inner struggle, in total freedom, one spouse empties oneself from his or her resentment, from anger, hate, pride, dies as in sacrificial offering for the other in order to grow in love. Can we apply all this? This is our question, especially for pastoral care. What is the orthodox path? First, allow me to say that we need to be convinced of this the theology. We need to be convinced of this orthodox phronema. The mystery of marriage, like other sacraments, does not work in man spontaneously, but requires one's contribution as synergia. It is a call to the way of the cross of martyrdom. The lover is always a martyr. Is the husband or the wife? Are they willing to become martyrs? This is the big question. The crowning ceremony emphasizes the church's view of the bride and the groom as martyrs. The mention of the 40 martyrs of Sebaste also confirms the path of love and witness. Far from today's spirit of hedonism and humanism, both spouses are called to exercise serious spiritual efforts to achieve self-control and total surrender to God's will. As part of the ascetic path of Christian life, all the appetites of the body, desires, and emotions, and not just those of a sexual type, need to be channeled and transformed. And the means is the practice of temperance, so prosceny, and continence. The fact, that, the fact is that real incompatibilities and misloved spouse are often found. Both husband and wife go through a long-term struggle to achieve working patterns of cooperative and constructive relationships. Spouses need to learn to forgive and to be tolerant of one another. However, they cannot achieve this without the support of their spiritual father. Here, Dr. Frank also mentioned about the role of the priest. A close connection needs to be established between the priest, the spiritual father, between fatherhood, spiritual fatherhood, and, and the husband and the wife, the bride and the groom. And this needs to be in the context of the sacrament of repentance. We need to regain spiritual fatherhood in the truest sense. The theology of marriage in the Orthodox Church responds to the fundamental spiritual needs of contemporary men. This theology is a living condition experienced every day by many families and couples joyously living in the world, but not of the world, despite changing circumstances. We have countless of examples of families living this theology today, and this really proves that this theology is ever living and ever will live. It is the way of, for human sanctification, for joy, glory, and beauty. 
fulfilling the likeness of God in deification, wherein Christian anthropology reaches its complete realization, its fails. Thank you again for listening to me.